URICSE and around the world and the International Cooperative Alliance. We're really happy to uh, have you joining us and thank you very much to our panelists who uh, I will introduce shortly. First, just a couple of uh, technical matters before we, we get started. Um, just to let you know, we are recording this session and it is also streaming live on Facebook. And uh, for those of you who saw the, the brief instructions at the beginning, if you uh, remove from your visualization those who um, don't have their video, then you can see just the panelists and it will help with your viewing of the, of the webinar, which now I need to do also for myself. So give me one second, sorry about that. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, I am Alana Gotts. I am. Uh, I work at Urixe. I um, work primarily with um, international projects related to the cooperative movement, and I'm really excited to welcome you all to this webinar today. Um, like I said, that we're doing in partnership with Around the World and um, International Cooperative Alliance. We are really excited about this. We. Um, we have three webinars planned. This first one today is about empowering workers. And we're gonna be screening two videos from the Around the World documentary series and uh, hearing from some of our researchers here at URICSE and also from the Around the World project. And then going to open uh, for discussion with those of you participating today. Um, it's really exciting to be able to share with all of you these these videos that uh, we here at Eurixa first saw back at the, the International Cooperative Alliance Conference um, in Kigali. And when we saw them, we were immediately um, really taken by them and, and moved and really wanted to be able to help share them uh, with a wider audience. And we thought this would be a really nice opportunity to um, bring in some of, um, some of the research and, and scholarly perspective from uh, the the studies that we conduct here at Eurixe and um, really combine those with the beautiful visuals and storytelling of the Around the World project. So really happy to, to be able to do this. Uh, like I said, this is the first of three scheduled webinars. Uh, so stay tuned, of course, for, for more. Um, we will have um, the screening of the videos, some comments from the researchers uh, from both Eurixe and Around the World. And then we will open it up to questions and answers uh, to those of you participating. So if you're watching us on Facebook, you can also put questions in the comment section there. Or also, if you're on Zoom, you can put questions in the chat box and we will have a question and answer session at the end. So um, first, let me uh, introduce our panelists. Happy to have with us today, uh, Ricardo Bodini, the director of URICSE. Julia Galera, senior researcher at URICSE. Uh, Sara Vicari, one of the co-founders of the Around the World Project. Cecile Beranger from uh, Around the World Project Research and Communications. And uh, Georgia Amato, also from the Around the World Project Research and Networking. And finally, uh, Mark Noel from International Cooperative Alliance and uh, Cooperatives Europe who I will immediately turn the floor over to uh, for some welcoming remarks. And Mark is um, the Co-ops for Development project is the key sponsor of the Around the World project. So I will let him uh, tell you more about that. Thank you, Ilana. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, happy to be to be here with you. Very happy to be here with you. So just a, a few words before we uh, kick off this um, these amazing videos. Uh, indeed, as Ilana said, um, ICA is running actually a, a partnership with the European Commission uh, on international cooperative development. And for us, this has been always uh, an important signal actually um, of recognition actually of the European Commission towards the cooperative model. Uh, as an important actor in international development. So the, the partnership that we are having with the European Commission is actually um, has a lot of, of, of aspects. It, it, of course, there is advocacy work, research, knowledge sharing, 
Um, and one of them is also visibility. And for us, it has been very important to um, showcase actually the cooperative model, to showcase uh, its, its impact. Everybody knows the saying that a picture says more than a thousand words. Well, you will discover it. This is certainly um, absolutely the case for the Around the World videos. So for us, the partnership actually with Around the World um, is really important as it gives actually that, um, that aspect that we try to explain to, to policymakers, to international institutions, to governments, which is actually the human face of, of the cooperative model, the, the people-centered businesses actually of the, of the cooperatives. This has, um, has a huge impact for, for our work because um, you, you will discover it in, in, in a while or, or maybe you have also seen already some of the videos. Um, the videos are convincing, they're touching, they're, they show another economic and social model, um, which is uh, not only utopia, which is already a reality. So for, for us as the, as the ICA, it is, it is crucial actually that we can, we can share how cooperatives and innovative cooperatives, uh, inclusive um, businesses uh, make really a huge uh, difference thanks to their, uh, to their model, to the democratic ownership uh, and control. And how actually this democratic ownership and control uh, is a real driver for decent work. So I'm, I'm looking forward to discover today, rediscover with you the, the videos and uh, have some great uh, exchanges about them. Thank you, Ilana, and thank you to all of you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I'd like to invite Sarah now to say a few words about the Around the World project, give us some, some ideas to what the, the, the whole project is about, and, um, and then specifically about the first video that we're gonna be screening today. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much, Ilana, and thank you, uh, Mark. We are uh, very happy that uh, we are organizing this event uh, today with uh, Rixe and then HACIA together. We've been working a lot, right, Ilana, uh, with uh, you and uh, Rixe in general to have this moment of uh, sharing today. So um, I'm happy now to introduce you a bit about uh, this project, the Around the World uh, Dark Hub project. Um, it all started uh, more than two years ago now um, as a, an idea of um, by myself and um, Andrea Mancori is my husband and he's a video maker and uh, I'm a researcher. So we came with this idea of uh, combining our respective uh, job and uh, have this opportunity, as uh, Mark was saying, um, to, to travel around the world and catch really the essence of what moved people to come together, to engage in collective action and to transform their territories, their lives through the uh, COP model. Um, and I'm also happy that today uh, we are here as a, um, in a more ambitious way, right? In the sense that uh, we are also a collective action story uh, uh, ourselves, in itself. Um, we are now a team made up of uh, video makers, uh, IT experts and researchers. So um, beyond me, there is today Cecile that you already introduced, uh, Cecile Beranger. She's getting a PhD on cooperative economics at the Metropolitan Manchester University. And Giorgio Mato, that she is uh, getting a PhD as well on human development at Rumatre uh, University. And what we do all together um, is to turn uh, research findings uh, into videos. Basically, our aim is to make uh, research findings uh, available to everyone. So including uh, cooperators, practitioners, uh, policymakers, uh, as uh, also Mark was saying, we screen together one of the videos at the International uh, Day of Cooperatives, the event organized by UN, and also went out to the research communities and have the opportunity to bring, uh, to use the videos to bring new insights, right, to the um, uh, debate. So um, if we go uh, back a bit to our history, as I said, we traveled. So um, after this initial idea, uh, we were so lucky to find the right partner in uh, the COPS for Dev program, in SEA and the COPS for Dev program. And then uh, it was January uh, 2019 when we uh, started this uh, around the world trip. 
Um, and actually, exactly these days last year, we were coming back uh, home. Um, the first story that we documented was in the south of Italy. And then uh, we moved to uh, Morocco, Rwanda, Nepal, um, Malaysia, Australia, California, uh, New York, Costa Rica, um, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and then uh, we, right, right now in September, last September, we documented a, a story in Poland, and we hope uh, soon uh, to document the last story of um, uh, this uh, project. And um, for sure, if you take the chance to watch our video, if you're ready, for those that have already watched them, you will notice that each video is different because each cooperative is different. So uh, each cooperative has uh, its own story. And uh, uh, as we work, when we visit a cooperative, uh, we spend with them at least uh, 10 days with members. We carry out uh, uh, participatory uh, research activities. And together with them, we build uh, the map of their stories. And only after that, we start uh, filming. And uh, so far, we documented the stories of uh, many different uh, sectors and um, also providing insights on, on different themes. So the moment uh, that uh, with um, Ilana, with the Rixi team, uh, we were discussing about uh, the, the topic to, uh, to be uh, shared and discussed today, uh, the idea came uh, on the future of work, right? So on uh, how empowering, how cop model can empower workers. And so we decided to focus among all our stories, we decided to focus on a region in particular. So the two stories that we documented in the United States. Um, and so this trip today will be uh, first with a video, the story that we documented in uh, New York, and then uh, we'll go together, we move to uh, California. Um, so before leaving you to, uh, to the video, just a few words about uh, the, the story that um, um, we'll be watching about new, the cop story in New York that is named Up and Go. Um, this is uh, one of the first uh, platform cooperatives to be set up, and surely, uh, surely this is the first one set up by uh, domestic uh, workers. The majority of workers are women migrants who uh, come together uh, um, in the form of uh, worker cooperatives to provide themselves with decent work opportunities. And additionally, these cooperatives um, also on a, a website uh, through which they get to manage uh, um, appointments to provide house cleaning services. And an interesting aspect is that they are the owner of this platform. Uh, they only pay 5% of what they earn to cover the administrative expenses that are needed to manage uh, the, the platform. So, and we will hear now, so I don't want to spoil more, but uh, this is right, really kind of a revolution. Um, so I will now you with the, with the video and then uh, with the food for thoughts that will be provided by Ricardo and Cecil. Thank you. Este proyecto de Apengo, el pertenecer a la cooperativa, nos ha dado como el hambre, esta hambre de crecimiento que al final de cuentas nos motiva, que tenemos de repente nuestros bajones de que estamos cansadas, queremos descansar. Pero cada vez que asistimos a un evento, a un trabajo, nos inspira y decimos vamos para adelante y queremos más y más. Nos ha dado 
esa motivación, esa pasión por lo, por lo que hacemos, porque a lo mejor en algún momento limpiaba la casa sin, y ahora voy y digo, wow, me siento tan profesional, me siento que yo estoy haciendo la diferencia. Y no solamente hago la diferencia en llegar y crear un ambiente brillante y limpio para mi cliente, sino estoy haciendo la diferencia porque estoy en un proyecto que sé que va a ayudar a muchísimas más personas, ¿no? Yo no sé qué sirve una app, para qué es, para qué cosa. Realmente no, no sabía, no entendía eso, ¿no? Ahorita que yo voy entendiendo eso, entonces me digo, wow, o sea, esto es otro mundo. Desde que llegué hace 16 años aquí a Nueva York, he trabajado de limpieza por mi cuenta y sí, sufrí muchas eh, cosas, no me pagaban. Eh, a veces me daba temor de, de rechazar un trabajo porque decía lo que me paguen es bueno porque necesito dinero, ¿no? Y, y tal vez eso, poco a poco, el mismo, el mismo idioma también me, me, me cortaba, ¿no? Cuando uno encuentra esas organizaciones o este tipo de proyectos innovadores como Up and Go, o sea, dice uno, wow, o sea, estaban esperando por mí, yo qué estaba haciendo allá, ¿no? Pero como les vuelvo a repetir, a veces nosotros nos ponemos nuestros propios límites, pero creo que desde el momento en que yo decidí abrir esta puerta para esta oportunidad, esa fecha está marcada en mi calendario porque ha hecho la diferencia en mi vida. Up and Go is a digital platform where people can book home cleaning and commercial cleaning services. But it's also a cooperative that is jointly owned by worker-owned cleaning businesses. Right now, there are three cleaning businesses and 22 members uh, or worker owners who are in those three cleaning co-ops. Up and Go was officially launched to the public in May 2017, but its origins go back much further than that. So I work for the Center for Family Life, which is a community-based organization here in Brooklyn in the Sunset Park neighborhood, which is a diverse immigrant community. And we provide a range of community services. And starting in 2006, we started helping workers organize their own businesses in the form of worker co-ops. One of our uh, partners who's been funding our work for some time, Robin Hood, which is a foundation here in New York that's focused on ending poverty, they were looking at changes in the gig economy or digital gig economy. There are many problems in the digital economy, right? So from uh, in very unclear status of the workers, so it's uh, often a gray area uh, if people are employees or if they are independent contractors. The platforms like Uber and others argue that the workers are really independent contractors. So you should think of a platform co-op as a, a platform. So that means a website or an app or a protocol even, which is central to uh, the operation to selling uh, goods or services of a cooperative. The worker owners of Up and Go, they are very proud. Uh, they own the IP rights to the platform. So they have the intellectual property of uh, the platform is in their own hands. Un día normal cuando nos levantamos temprano es desayunar con los niños y después pues ver ya la orden que uno tiene para ir al trabajo. Yo veo el teléfono y, y por parte de, de la plataforma que eso tengo pues nos mandan por WhatsApp, nos manda un, la orden y nosotros tenemos que buscar el, el lugar donde vamos a ir al trabajo. Preparo mis cosas. 
preparo mis líquidos para trabajar, que son orgánicos, por cierto. Voy, trabajo cuatro o cinco horas, eso es mi trabajo. Y ya por la tarde, pues uno llega con los niños y a descansar un rato. Y el día siguiente, es, si hay trabajo, si sí, hay que chequear otra vez el teléfono por si te, te llegó otra orden para ti. Tengo un niño de 20 años. Él me dice que, ay, mami, dice, ahora te veo contenta para trabajar, mami. Antes venías enojada, te enojabas por cualquier cosa. Ahora no, mami. Ahora te miro que vienes contenta del trabajo. Y yo creo que, mami, es por la cooperativa, ¿verdad? Te digo que las redes sociales son importantes y las podemos agarrar para bueno. Le digo, si no estuviéramos en OpenGo, todavía no trabajáramos. Porque OpenGo nos hace rápido trabajar, le digo. Dice, ¿de verdad? Le digo, sí. Ok, mami, dice. Pero yo te veo muy contenta ahora trabajando. Y yo creo que eso es más bonito porque... No te pones enojada con los hijos, vas mejor en la casa, trabajas con gusto y pues cuidas las, los hogares de las demás personas. We are excited about the development and the growth of platform cooperatives here in the United States and, and across the globe. We know that the platform economy is not the economy that's coming, it's the economy that's here. We also know from our history in the United States that Cooperatives have given people the power in their business and in their economy to take care of themselves, to take care of their families, and take care of their communities. And it, you know, for instance, uh, here in the U.S., those sectors that have gone to scale include agriculture, credit unions, uh, rural electric cooperatives. The, the economy today also includes the, 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 perhaps the most important commodity of zeros and ones, of information. And so we are excited that the cooperative community sees this opportunity and is beginning to seize the opportunity for people to take control, to benefit, and to own the platform economy. My life before I belonged to the cooperative of Apengo was very different. Antes no conocía mis derechos, los salarios no eran justos, las horas también eran, a, a veces también llegaba un poco a la explotación, sufríamos pues acoso sexual, muchas otras cosas que realmente ahora con la educación y el nivel que tenemos ahora con pertenecer al grupo de Apengo, la cooperativa, entonces me ha marcado diferencia ahora. De un año a otro año hemos visto el crecimiento. Mi crecimiento económico también ha sido de un 20% más. Además de que, como dicen, yo puedo trabajar menos horas y con un precio que antes yo tenía para trabajar todo el día. Ahora puedo pensar ahorrar para algún bien futuro, eh, no sé, una casa, un auto, tener un lugar donde en mi país. O sea, tengo como que otras metas, pero porque las veo, veo tangibles, ¿no? En cada mes, en todo lo que cobro, ¿no? No somos robots, ni mucho menos. Somos personas que sentimos y que tenemos un buen día y que tenemos un mal día. Pero si estamos juntas, yo siento el apoyo de mi hermana, en este caso aquí, pero también siento el apoyo de mis otras hermanas cuando nos toca reunirnos, ¿no? Y creo que eso es lo más importante de resaltar de esto. No solamente es un trabajo, sino también es una hermandad y van de la mano. No puede crecer una si no ha crecido la otra. Vamos de la mano y ahí vamos. Y creo que eso es lo mayor, más importante de esto. La pango.
Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing this video. It's um, incredibly inspiring. I've seen it a few times, and yet every time I see it again, it still is um, very captivating and uh, such a such a good story. And I think that we might actually be joined by um, some of the stars of this video on our webinar today, uh, which is fantastic. And um, we'd love to hear from them uh, during the question and answer during the debate period. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn over to Ricardo Bodini for some initial reactions, some, some comments on this video. Um, like I mentioned before, we're going to hear from um, Yurikse and then from around the world. Then we'll have the, the second video. And if you want to start putting questions into the chat box, then we'll open it up to questions afterwards. But uh, first, some, some reactions from Ricardo on this first video. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, well, everybody already commented on how great these videos are. And for us as researchers, um, when we see a story like this, the first question that comes to mind is, well, is this, this is great, it's a, but is it just a kind of an inspiring story that is relevant for the space and time where it takes place? Or uh, can you tell us something more? Or is it relevant kind of beyond uh, the context in which it took place? In this case, uh, New York, uh, the US, the, the uh, workers in, in the cleaning industry. And um, I think this story in particular is extremely relevant and timely uh, because the, the things we're seeing here are tied to some major shifts, um, actually in the way the world of work is shaping up uh, globally. As a result of um, some, some key trends we see playing out across the world, uh, we know we have the surplus of labor uh, globally. We know that uh, firms in the global economy kind of delocalize and, and uh, place their production activities chasing lower labor and uh, lower uh, regulation on uh, labor laws. And of course, we know about the effects of the you know, technological advances the information technology, uh, artificial intelligence on the world of work. And the, the result of all these different forces is that basically the, the quality of work is deteriorating um, across sectors and across, uh, across the world. We're seeing uh, more and more kind of non-standard forms of employment, uh, shorter or precarious contracts, uh, lower wages and so forth. And uh, what we're also seeing is a kind of polarization of the labor market between uh, high skilled jobs paying more and more and low skilled jobs paying less and less. And uh, thinking about the US context, if you look at the, say how wages have changed over the past 50 some years, you can see that up until the eighties, whether you had a kind of you know, high school diploma or, or a college degree, your, your earnings were going up more or less at the same rate. And, but then since the 80s, we've seen a huge uh, di um, divergence between the two. And so if you have a higher education degree, your chances of earning more and more are greater. If you have a high school diploma lower, uh, you will see your, your real wages declining over time. Um, and so uh, the other thing we're seeing is that where we, where we do have new opportunities for employment, it's often in service sector, uh, a sector that is more prone to kind of worker exploitation and uh, the substandards for formal work. Um, so in this scenario, what we're seeing is that uh, cooperatives in general, right, can really play a very important role. We've seen a great example here, but we can make a more general case for uh, cooperatives really being a different type of enterprise because as Mark was saying in his opening remarks, these are people-centered businesses. What does that mean? It means that cooperatives place the basic needs of people, you know, their members and their communities at the center of their activity and as the main goal of their economic activity. And um, this really causes them to behave differently with regards to workers. Uh, not just for worker cooperatives, but, but cooperatives uh, across the world, uh, I mean, across you know, the spectrum uh, of different cooperative types, uh, you know, for instance, they're less likely to delocalize uh, in search of cheaper labor. They're less likely to lay off their workers uh, during a recession. They typically tend to distribute a higher percentage of the value they produce 
to their workers. Um, in where we have data, this really bears it out. Uh, we see that you know cooperatives usually uh, distribute more than uh, double the share of their value added to their workers relative to for-profit um, corporations. And that is particularly true in the service sector. So um, this is the case for all cooperatives, like I was saying, whether it's consumer cooperatives or worker cooperatives or agricultural cooperatives uh, right across sectors. But of course, it's even more true for worker cooperatives, like, uh, like the ones we've seen featured in this video, because in addition to all the things uh, I was saying before, and those all hold true, of course, the fact that the workers are owners of the enterprise and have a buy-in and an ownership stake in the, in the company uh, really makes uh, their work a lot more rewarding. It, it really empowers them at a level that you wouldn't find in any other kind of enterprise form. And I think the video really showed it and uh, some of what the, uh, the ladies featured on the video were saying, uh, you know, the work is the same, right? You're, you're still, you know, providing a cleaning service, but the satisfaction you gain out of that job is dramatically different because now you have an ownership stake. Now you feel like you're part of the decision-making process. And of course, you're also being paid better. You have better uh, social security and, and healthcare coverage and all the other things that go into making decisions about the workers when the business is owned uh, by the workers, right? So for all these reasons, we see that this, this type of businesses, and of course, in the case that we have here, uh, are really can really play a key role and are playing a key role relative to the shifts and this evolution of the, the world of work that I was describing. Um, but then there's a second layer to this video, which is also extremely important and relevant that has to do with the role of platforms and the gig economy, right? Because this is another key evolution in, in the world of work, especially uh, when we talk about, um, you know, freelance workers, whether it's in cleaning services, but the same holds true for delivery, for cab drivers, uh, all the way to creative industries and designers. And you can make the case in any, uh, in any of these sectors where work is very fragmented and often uh, the services are intermediated and organized through digital platforms um, in the so-called sharing economy. Uh, and some of the rhetoric goes to you know, emphasize the sharing aspect of these platforms. But really, if you look at the, uh, at the way they work, in most cases, uh, because of the governance and the ownership structure, they're designed to extract value uh, from those workers and transfer it to the shareholders. So the people who hold the capital got invested in the startup and uh, have ownership of the platform. Um, and so again, uh, what we're seeing here when we, we apply the cooperative model uh, to digital platforms, like in this case, really the governance and ownership structure makes all the difference in the world, right? Because now the platform is owned uh, by the workers. It means you have access uh, to governance and ownership of the platform. It means that the pricing um, and how the value is redistributed is dramatically different because now you have a say in uh, how the pricing is set and what you get paid uh, for the service that you provide through the platform. And then of course, another key aspect that I think was touched upon briefly is the ownership of the data and the intellectual property. So we know that in the digital economy, that is often the, the real wealth and the real resource, right? And, um, in addition to the labor being put in, one of the byproducts that's often just as valuable is the data that's generated. Uh, of course, in the case of cooperative platforms like Up and Go, that ownership is retained by the workers. And what this means is that it's a system uh, to basically take all the value that's produced down the value chain and bring it back to the workers instead of uh, taking it out uh, and rewarding the shareholders. Um, and this is also partly what makes it possible to make a living and a decent living, even providing uh, work and in sectors that traditionally are low paying. Um, but because you retain the ownership and you retain the value, then all of a sudden you can actually uh, get, your work is actually valued more and you can get more value from it. And by the way, this is, mm, uh, 
something we see across in other types of cooperatives as well. If you're a small farmer, it's the, the way that agricultural cooperatives work with small farmers is very similar to what we're seeing here. So it really is uh, the, the structure of the enterprise, the governance, the ownership rights, the way it distributes the value. Those are the things that really make a difference, not just the label of, oh, this is a, a digital platform, it's sharing economy. You have to look kind of under the hood and see how that enterprise works. And I think uh, this case is, uh, is a great illustration of, of those principles. So I, I'm really glad that some of the uh, protagonists of the video are here with us and uh, looking forward to a productive discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, definitely some uh, key points there, some food for thought, things to come back to um, in the discussion. And certainly I think we'll see um, when we watch the next video that uh, there are a lot of these uh, characteristics that are transversal across cooperatives, yet each one has their um, unique aspects as well. I'd like to ask Cecile if she has any um, anything to add based on these comments and, you know, having participated in the uh, the research and the, the production process of, of the videos, um, she can give us some further insights into this cooperative. Thank you, Ricardo, for this really interesting insights and uh, Ilana for introducing me. So yes, um, I think the Up and Go Cooperative shows how COPs can provide uh, effective answers to the so-called uberization of the economy and the overall to the digital gig economy. As we know, there are several problems related to the digital economy, right? Uh, for instance, the status of worker is really unclear. We still don't know if workers are independent contractor or if they are employees. There is a lack of effective tool to foster decent work and uh, create protection for the workers in the gig economy. And last but not least, very few persons can benefit from the profit generated. So that's why, that's why in 2014, scholars such as Trevor Schultz that we have interviewed in uh, this video uh, started rethinking the digital economy. So they started asking themselves, mm, but what if workers own the platform where they work? What if workers and users own the platform that they use? So there are several experiences such as Up and Go I could also mention for Airbnb, the cooperative alternative to Airbnb that have been launched a few months ago that underline that platform uh, owned cooperatively can be an answer to mitigate the problem related to the digital economy. Moreover, this platform can be a process to, to for workers cop that now need, nowadays need to be involved in the digital economy. In fact, as underlined by the president of NCBA, the platform economy is not the economy that's coming, but it's the economy that's already here. And also for this reason, um, the up and go cup story is particularly relevant as it shows how action research is important. In fact, two, three, through this video, we want to take action. So we hope to inspire communities and let them know that alternative to mainstream platform economy are already here. And yeah, thank you. And I give back the floor to Sarah, who will introduce another inspirational workers on COP story, the Chibok Collective, and then looking forward for uh, the debate. Thank you so much, Cecile. Thank you. Yeah, Sara, go ahead and um, I'll just remind everybody we'll take questions at the end about both videos. But if Sara, if you could um, introduce us to the second screening. Thank you very much. So that's uh, amazing to see uh, how through a video we can uh, we are inspired and uh, a debate can be stimulated. And uh, we move now to another story uh, that is, as I said, uh, still yet in a US, we are moving to California in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, this is a story of another worker cop. Um, it's a bakery, it's the Cheeseboard Collective. 
And uh, it's a special story, particularly because of the governance structure. As you will see, it's a totally uh, flat, horizontal uh, organization. And uh, just some uh, information about uh, its beginning, because it's nice also how it started. Um, back in the 70s, there were a couple uh, that had a family company organized as a, was a cheese store. Um, and they had employees, uh, but uh, basically the relation that they established with uh, the employees was uh, on an equal basis and based on uh, equal pay for equal work rule. Um, and so then basically the natural follow up was to set up a cooperative. So now this cooperative with this very peculiar uh, governance structure has been there since more than 50 years. And uh, I'll leave you with the story, I don't want to spoil, but uh, it's Another, another absolutely very interesting and inspiring uh, story. So thank you. I'll leave you watch. We'll be right here with the video coming in just a moment. I'm not sure if we're having technical difficulties here. Um, I'll take the opportunity during the pause to, oh, here we go, it's starting. <laughs> been a part of the Cheese Board Cooperative for 44 years now. I came to California from Ohio when I was in my middle 20s in order to work off alternative service to the draft uh, during the Vietnam War as a conscientious objector to the war itself. And I moved uh, to Berkeley and worked in community service for uh, several years in a hospital. During that time, uh, I met some people who were at the Cheese Board Cooperative. It wasn't actually a cooperative in the very beginning. It was uh, started as a small ma and pa store uh, selling cheese in 1967. By 1970-71, the owners, Sahak and Elizabeth, suggested that because they were already paying their employees the same wage they were taking themselves, why don't we just turn this into a cooperative, or the term that they used in those days was a collective. It was a, an immediate success. my friends I'm going to cheese board they're like oh my gosh you're so lucky bring me back a piece it's it's like a well-known place that people want to be a part of it's like a, it is a community here the Bay Area is an expensive place to live you don't need a lot of money to come here you can just come and sit and eat a slice of pizza you share a table with people you hear nice music you know weather is wonderful I didn't really know anything about this place until I went uh, to middle school and uh, I used to have to walk back and forth and I used to see the lines here 
and I will always wonder what's in this place where people who are sitting outside where it's raining cats and dogs and people still sitting outside so I finally came here and realized it was vegetarian pizza and I'm a meat eater so I'm like what the hell is this? <laughs> We started out with a, you know, a very homogeneous group, kind of radical hippies or something, back in um, the early 70s. But it has been a goal of ours to become more diverse, to reflect the greater population. The biggest criterion to be here is that you want to be here. You want to be part of this kind of uh, alternative political or governing body where we look at capitalism as not the only possible way that you can have, make a living. We want to... <coughs> people that have <coughs> all kinds of skills to come and share their skills with us. We make uh, $24 an hour. We all make the same wage, um, regardless of how long you've been here. So that's kind of unusual. And then at the end of the year, we split up the profit. No, also not based on seniority, which might be, or investment, which would be the traditional way of splitting up profit, but on the number of hours each person worked. We make about in profit um, probably over a million dollars a year. It's a lot of money if someone owned this business. It's a lot of money to me. But then we split up among 65 members. It becomes a, a modest amount of money for each person. And so it comes out to about another um, 10, 11 dollars per hour. The cheese board work on them kind of a anarchic kind of model of um, equal pay for equal work. It's an hourly pay. It doesn't matter what kind of job you do. Usually if you come from another kind of uh, workplace, you would see that you have an employer or a manager. And then on the other hand, you have an employee that does what the manager says. And any input that comes from the employee is kind of looked down or ignore. It's bad for the employee, it's bad for the business. And so the idea within the cheese board, I feel, is that all the job is equally paid, but also all the jobs are rotated. At other places I've used to work, like, you do the exact same thing every single day over and over and over again. And this is so much variety. Um, and it's super nice to just be able to learn and do so many different things every single day. You know, in all of the jobs that I have had in the past, I always used to think to myself, like, oh, you know, if I was the owner, how would I do it differently? But it just ends up being that I found this type of business where um, I don't have to be, like, a rich millionaire starting an own company in order to like have a say in my place of work. I think that we all work a little harder and care a little bit more because it is ours and when we do well, we, we as individuals also get to benefit from that. And When I was a manager at a different business, I never liked punishing people or bossing people around. It's not in my personality. So it's a uh, better fit for me personally to be in a workspace that's non-hierarchical and where we all just kind of make decisions as a group for what's best. There are so many places I've worked where I was one of the few people of color and the people who were in charge were often white men. And I think there's something about that that sets the tone of who has power and who doesn't. One thing that's been really good about working here is that it just the way the structure is set up, everyone is equal. So even though it might feel like the power isn't necessarily shared completely equally, it is so much better than other places. And you know, I'm an immigrant and a woman of color, and this is one of the most empowering places I've ever I've spent 28 years in the food service. I've never had paid time off, never had um, health care paid for. They've never had it covered for me. And that I was able to get health care from day one. $400 a month that I didn't have to pay you know, out of my own pocket. We allow 
people to be flexible with the schedules. I guess the majority work around 40 hours, 35 to 40 hours. But if people need less or more, they have a proposal ready for the group at the monthly meeting and then people are usually nice. And, and the reason is always the same because you will never know what life brings to you. And so, you know, one day they might need, one day I might need. You know, like for example, I, uh, five, six years ago, I was working like 50, 60 hours because, you know, I was single and no kids. And I was like, um, I want to do this, my business, more money for me. And now I have a son. So I would like to spend more time for, with my son. So I try to work 35, 40 hours. And so I can spend more time with my, when my son grows up. That's, that's all. reasons in my personal opinion that we have been as successful as a cooperative uh, ourselves is because every four or five years we decide to try something new. For example, the business started just as a cheese store, but uh, pretty quickly people realized that uh, with cheese, bread went uh, very easily uh, in the palate. And so we started baking breads and selling it at the store. Uh, eventually, years later, we decided to combine the bread and the cheese and make a pizza. We decided that uh, even though we didn't want to continue to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we would try and duplicate ourselves. We basically franchise ourselves with the idea of starting another cooperative that would have the same kind of rewarding life and community building aspect that we have found. We called it the Arismendi uh, Cooperative uh, because of uh, the name of a famous Spanish priest who started a cooperative movement in Spain, which we admired greatly. There are five different bakeries, call, all called Ayers Mindy in the San Francisco Bay Area. Cheese Board was the original co-op and we approached them and we said, we'd like to start new businesses based on your model. Would you support us in doing that? And they were incredibly generous in helping, providing recipes, providing training, allowing their name to be used, and they still mem maintained their membership since then. In the United States, there's been, among progressive people, there's been very much an, a perspective that small is beautiful and that's the only thing that you should do. Becoming big is a problem. And for us, we, were, we kind of think that if you're only small, then you're also marginal, and you're not really helping out with larger social needs. So we wanted to find a way that co-ops could stay small and serve in their, their immediate community, but network such that they could have an effect on the overall society. In the last decade or so, we've seen a great increase in interest in using the cooperative business model uh, for workers to empower themselves in the economy. Um, in fact, just last year, the U.S. Congress passed a law called the Main Street Employee Ownership Act that directed the federal government to make technical assistance in financing available to people who wanted to use worker cooperatives as a business model. Uh, we're excited about this because just like in many places across the globe, in the United States, we are experiencing increased inequality. Uh, we certainly recognize that people, many people, feel that uh, they're losing their place in the economy. And worker co-ops are one of the best strategies for people to, again, uh, take control. Take control of their work life, take control of their workplace, so that, um, so that they can take care of their families and take care of their communities. Even though we are attempting to build the idealistic community in which to live, and we're working hard to do so, and we're sharing uh, all of the things that we have to offer, we're still 
made up of people that are human beings that have their flaws. We all have our flaws. And uh, so because of those flaws, uh, there are conflicts. The larger you get, in some ways, the harder it is to make a community that uh, shares all of the same ideals. At the Cheese Board, when we make decisions, we have uh, four levels of decision making. You can say yes. You can vote yes. You can vote abstain. You can abstain and not vote. You can vote no, or you can vote a hard no. And a hard no is like a blocking no. And in order to use, to stop something, you have to have a very, very important moral reason that you could not work here if this happened. And we have a facilitator come and help us organize our meetings. We have, um, and at first I was kind of hesitant about it because I like the fact that we self-facilitated and it seemed very private. But in the end, I think it, uh, it's helped the group a lot come to move forward and make decisions because the bigger we get, the harder it is to kind of corral the group. I'm not a worker owner, so I don't have a stake in the decisions. Like, I never care what decision the group makes. I care that the group makes the best decision for the groups. Sometimes I think the role I can bring is, is to bring the outside perspective of, oh, do you remember four years ago when you didn't have this? And do you remember all the work you did to get this? And when I first came in, the cooperative was, was pretty big, not as big as it is now. Um, but it was using a lot of the practices from when it was smaller and they didn't meet the needs of the bigger co-op. And what I've gotten to see over the span of seven years is the co-op really get a better sense of what are our needs now. I think they've come to the realization we need more structure than we had and we need more things written down to refer back to than we had. Um, and then I get to help them to meet those needs and it's really beautiful to see, yeah. You're really vulnerable to a, uh, to a couple people who could be really negative, can really bring a, a business like this down, amazingly. I think that's a, that's a problem to confront also, and the more committed people you have the more successful you could be too. So you're you're somewhat at the mercy of the constellation of people that you put together. As opposed to a traditional business, you just fire the ones that don't work out. It's harder for a cooperative. So I think that's something we learned. Well sometimes I think about the you know, cheese board is like being part of a big family. So that means that we're we function and we don't function. You know, we argue and we love each other. And so much of the cheese board is like that. But it is also this thing where you can get up in the morning and you can look in the mirror and feel like I have done as little harm as I can. I have actually, what I do here is try to make things better. I can't say in a big way necessarily what I believe uh, and what kind of society I want to live in. But if I show it, uh, that's a pretty powerful statement. And that's why I'm still at the cooperative after 44 years. But it's my community, it's my family, it's my extended family now. And so I don't, I don't want to leave it, even though I don't want to work as hard as I did when I was young. And so, uh, and I want to show more and more people uh, the advantages of working cooperatively rather than competitively. Whether it will be successful in the end, nobody knows.
Thank you again, Sarah. That another, I, I love this video. I love this story. And it really um, shows how putting worker owners at the center uh, can make a difference. And so to speak more to this, um, I'll turn it over to Julia Galera from Eurixe for some initial comments and reactions to the story. Thank you very much, Ilana, and thank you very much for inviting me today. I would like to thank and congratulate first the authors of the two very inspirational videos we have just watched. As it was already said, they provide food for thought as they identify very clearly the main aspects of strength of both cooperatives and hence suggest some lessons to be learned also by other cooperatives that may be positively inspired by the solutions, models of service and instruments that have been designed by these two worker cooperatives. So as requested, I will try to shed some light on the factors explaining, in my view, um, the success of Cheeseboard. As we have seen, Cheeseboard Collective emerged on the initiative of some radical hippies back in the early 70s. But over its more than 40 years of life, Cheeseboard has managed to grow into a more heterogeneous group, which engages now people that are distinguished by different motivations, backgrounds and expectations, while sharing, however, the same desire to experiment with an alternative economic model and also trigger a change in society. Cheeseboard has managed to adjust its tools, devices and models over time uh, consistently with the evolution of its membership, but also with its growth in size, as well as consistently with uh, the new demands and uh, needs uh, uh, arising in, in society. So the tools and mechanism uh, Cheeseboard has experimented with contribute to explaining its capacity to survive over time, which is not a case of all enterprises and neither of all cooperatives. So one key feature explaining uh, Cheeseboard uh, success is uh, the strong commitment of its workers. Workers are highly satisfied and eager to cooperate. First of all, thanks to the peculiar um, organization of work and power cheese board in place, which um, encourages convergence towards the adoption of uh, cooperative behaviors. And it also stimulates the, the alignment of the goals of the cooperative with the goals of uh, its workers. As it was uh, highlighted also by, by Sarah, cheese board has a horizontal non-hierarchical structure, which enhances cooperation rather than competition. But additional devices include the equal wages that are paid for equal work to all workers, independently from the type of work and responsibility taken on, and the rotation of working tasks. Cheeseboard uh, strategy of, uh, reconci of, um, of uh, reconciling professional and personal life has furthermore a key role in increasing the level of satisfaction of workers. At the same time, uh, while Cheeseboard guarantees high levels of protection for its workers, the latter are also uh, encouraged to be proactive. So in essence, Cheeseboard has designed an effective and coherent work incentive structure, which seems to motivate workers and drive their uh, engagement uh, successfully. The second feature that explains, in, in, in my view, Cheeseboard's success is the active engagement of the local community it has managed to further. Cheeseboard is not exclusively a well-functioning worker cooperative. In other words, it is not simply aimed at promoting the interest of its workers, which is, however, very relevant, but based on the interviews of the video, Cheeseboard has contributed to creating a sense of community and has been successful in attracting people that have different relations with the cooperative, including uh, its clients. 
So recalling um, the words of one interviewed uh, person, cheese board is a place people want to be part of. So despite its growth, its community connotation has survived over time. So cheese board seems to, um, to have, um, for instance, successfully managed uh, the challenges posed by the increase in number of its members, which have inevitably increased uh, the cost of democracy, namely the cost of taking collective decisions given the more heterogeneous interests that are now at stake when compared to the past, to the very beginning, when the group, the founding group was very homogeneous. So how? Cheese board has adjusted its decision-making procedures so to prevent conflicts and allow for an effective management of potential conflicts that may arise, Cheeseboard has put in place some proper devices. So it has appointed a facilitator who helps members take decision and it has designed a voting procedure um, as it was uh, described with four levels of decision making with a hard uh, no vote uh, that can be used, that is used only in extreme cases. And this um, mechanism helped to reach consensual decisions, differently from many other cooperatives that end up uh, um, mimicking conventional enterprises in their endeavor to improve their, their market performance, Cheeseboard has apparently designed consistent management tools that reflect its rationale and so ena they enable to exploit, exploit the key advantages of being a cooperative. Firstly, those that re result from the strong and active engagement uh, of, of its members and also uh, of the community. But there is also a third feature which, ha which has to do with market success. So cheese board is not simply a ro locally rooted community initiative, uh, neither. It is also a very successful business. So according to, to the video, market success uh, is traced back to the flexible business model of Cheeseboard. And as described by one of its founders, new products have been proposed every four, five or six years since Cheeseboard startup. So cheese first, bread in a second phase, and a combination of cheese and bread to make pizza in a third phase. So cheese board success lies uh, certainly in its capacity to guess what works, but not only. It also lies in its capacity to design a consistent uh, scaling strategy that has stimulated innovation while enabling also to safeguard the community anchorage of Cheeseboard. In, in essence, rather than scaling wide, uh, that, which is the strategy typically adopted by for-profit and by conventional enterprises, Cheeseboard has furthered the replication of its well-functioning model, which has hence enabled to take advantage of the benefits of remaining small and rooted in the community. So this uh, peculiar scaling pattern uh, recalls also other, other similar um, models that have been implemented, for instance, in Italy by Italian consortia of social cooperatives back in, in, in the 90s when this new cooperative form, the social cooperative form, took root in Italy and this model actually had a role in supporting the growth of social cooperatives significantly across uh, uh, all the country. So um, some, some other remarks, Cheeseboard, so some closing remarks I would say because I, otherwise I think we don't have time for a, a final discussion. So Cheeseboard is clearly a successful business that relies on very committed workers and has strong ties with the local community. So it has succeeded in facing new challenges and has been able to size new opportunities while remaining anchored to its original desire to trigger a change in society. So 
its desire to uh, experiment with, um, with an alternative economic model is still there after more than 40 years and continues to, um, to adhere to the same cooperative values and principles that uh, um, had inspired Cheeseport Absurge. So I would have some other comments, but I think I will stop here to give space also to, to the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll turn it straight over to Georgia Amato for some additional comments from the around the world side. And then um, again, we'll open it up to questions and answers. Um, so if you want to put any questions in the chat, please go ahead and do so now. Georgia. Yeah, thank you, Ilana, for the floor. Uh, thank you, Julia, very much for all your comments and uh, all the precious insights uh, you, you gave. Uh, actually, you touched uh, all the uh, crucial points um, that exactly uh, describe uh, the, this cooperative, the organization they have, and also the work uh, uh, they do. In your intervention, you highlight uh, so much uh, the importance of community. And in fact, uh, uh, community is uh, one of the most um, frequent, one of the most uh, recurrent words uh, used uh, in the video, actually. And um, the common threads that bind um, all the people together in this, um, in this cooperative story is actually the sense of community. This video shows how uh, community is built day by day on daily basis, uh, both inside of um, the co-op as well as outside. They clearly state that they prefer to keep the co-op small in order to intervene, in order to, uh, to stay close to the community, to serve the community. They, they use uh, actually the word the um, verb uh, serve, which is uh, too much important. Uh, members uh, together built their own idea of community, enlarged uh, the concept of the community, um, and uh, uh, in order to embed the wider society that is around them. So this is uh, too much important, and uh, and we we um, uh, I, I mean, uh, what's uh, behind uh, the sense of community? For sure, uh, it is motivations. Uh, individual motivation uh, are actually the engines uh, that build and shape uh, the collective action. Collective action uh, um, represents uh, the full realization of uh, common needs, common aspirations, uh, and also the common vision. So we are uh, now traveling on uh, high, high frequency, important value. Um, while uh, keeping always uh, the, um, the, ident the individual identities. Um, and what, uh, why, collec uh, why collective action is uh, so much important? Uh, collective action actually enhances uh, uh, individual agency and expands uh, um, personal uh, uh, well-being, as well as, uh, of course, uh, it improves uh, uh, cooperative uh, profitability. Uh, the, actually, the expansion of uh, people's well-being here represents uh, one of the fundamental aspects that uh, we want to um, highlight. Uh, people, for sure, uh, choose to be part of the, of the cooperative, uh, not just uh, uh, for income, which for sure it is too much important. We are talking about um, a working cooperative, but uh, um, they want to improve the quality of their life. Uh, members in the, in the video uh, talk about uh, health insurance, talk about um, the cooperative as uh, an empowering space, an empowering place, uh, and um, they talk about the importance uh, to have a say in the decision making. So we are uh, always, um, uh, we are again uh, talking about uh, um, I, uh, an high level of uh, motivations. This video uh, contains uh, as many, many contents. And uh, we, uh, as a research group in, um, in aroundtheworld.com, uh, during the last year, we, have, we had uh, the opportunity actually to hold uh, some courses uh, to masters. And uh, we always uh, keep advantage of this uh, precious video be, uh, in order to uh, explain uh, the cooperative principle in practice. Uh, because uh, 
in this video we can um, actually uh, see all the all the principle put uh, in place uh, for real uh, and it's always a strong experience for students and uh, practitioners and so we are uh, very very uh, proud of this uh, of this of this video so thank you very much for the attention and uh, i give uh, the floor uh, again to ilana thank you again Thank you so much, Georgia. Thank you to all of our panelists for um, all of these reflections and comments. And there's um, there's so many aspects to um, to both of these cooperatives that uh, you know we could probably talk all day about it. Um, but there is a question in the chat uh, specifically about um, Up and Go that. Um, so they, she's asking about the uh, the motivation for doing for specifically choosing a worker cooperative instead of um, perhaps a cleaning workers union or a different kind of model. Um, I will turn this over to Sarah perhaps to give an initial response. And um, I do know that we are joined here by some of the members of Up and Go. I don't know if they uh, would like to respond directly, but first uh, let's turn it over to Sarah. Thank you very much, Ilana. Uh, first of all, well, I'm so happy uh, to see it. I want really to thank uh, Ricardo, Julia, and uh, of course, Cecilia and Giorgio for this very rich debate. And it's very nice to see how every time we watch the video and with different people and different sites uh, come in. So this is very, very nice for us, very rewarding, I would say as well. Um, so I'm very happy to see that uh, Araceli and uh, Sirenia join us today. The questions is very interesting. So why uh, you decided uh, to go for a worker cooperative and not for other organizations? Well, um, since we have them, I mean, I cannot re reply for them. Uh, I can just say what actually um, we, we saw, we experienced uh, being with them. And, and just to contribute with a very uh, small insight uh, to the debate on that video, but what actually uh, platform co-ops, I believe, uh, is a very uh, interesting model is how to take advantage of uh, new technology. Uh, at the same time, what I really like of uh, this model is that uh, there is a real life. So women stay together. They are organized as a worker co-op. Uh, which means that they have they can enjoy the two pillars of uh, what means being a cop. So the entrepreneurship aspect, but at the same time the participatory aspect. What means really being together and uh, go hand in hand, as they were saying, like uh, sisters, right? So really this aspect of uh, living together and facing together problems. Um, so, so that that's really something um, interesting of the of what actually we could observe that motivated them to be in a cooperative because at the same time you can uh, move forward on these two aspects. Um, but I would leave, uh, of course, to them to to answer with their own words and their own experience. If Araceli and Sirenia would like to join, or feel uh, comfortable to join the the, the discussion. Uh, Araceli, ¿estás aquí? Sirenia. Sí, buenas tardes. Sí, estoy aquí. No. Buenas. Qué bien, estamos. Um, do you mind if I shift to, to Spanish and then perhaps we can facilitate with the translation, right? So, uh -huh. estamos muy felices que están aquí, que están participando eh, en esta, esta tarde con nosotros. Bueno, um, hay una... Pregunta para vosotras. Eh, es eh, eh, una pregunta que llega de Indonesia. Entonces, eh, muy, muy bueno saber que están compartiendo, están compartiendo con otro lado del mundo. Y eh, estaba preguntando eh, por qué han decidido de formar una cooperativa. Ah, ahora te veo. <ríe> qué bien. Eh, qué bien de verte. Entonces, la pregunta es por qué han decidido de formar una cooperativa y no, por ejemplo, de una ola sirena, y no, por ejemplo, un sindicato o otra forma de organización. Eh, pues realmente nosotros estamos en busca de, de oportunidades para crear nuestro negocio. 
y se presentó en ese momento un open house donde nos dijeron que podríamos hacer nuestro propio negocio y de ahí entendimos poco a poco que era una cooperativa y nos interesó más ese proyecto porque es realmente para la comunidad, no para un solo beneficiario. Entonces, realmente fue eso y a partir de que estamos, empezamos en la cooperativa, nos hizo entender que queremos cambios, que queremos oportunidades para todos, pero también queremos dignidad en el trabajo y no solo dignidad en el trabajo, eh, ser autosuficientes y sustentables. Okay, can I, can I just translate one, sorry, so, so, um, so basically, as Araceli has just said that everything started because they were actually looking for opportunities for their business, uh, so they, they wanted to advance in their business. Um, and in fact, here there is the role, of course, of the uh, center uh, where also Sylvia works. Uh, so basically, uh, they organized themselves initially. Uh, they were trying to um, for solutions. They were looking for solutions, uh, but uh, um, they were in a way trained to to form a cooperative. So it was an external suggestion to choose exactly for the cooperative form of business. But step by step, uh, they understood that uh, was was a, a good option because at the same time they could get benefits for themselves, but also to benefit uh, and, to, uh, and to contribute to the co community development. Um, and uh, and and the end, this was, uh, as she was saying, was a good choice, a right choice, because it was an opportunity for uh, all of them to make a change, uh, to find an opportunity of decent work and uh, of autonomy and to be sustainable and uh, um, self 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 sufficient. Yes, so self um, sustain sustain themselves. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you. Sirenia, you want to add something? You want to add something? Sirenia, yes, please. Sí, Sirenia, eh, por favor. Yes, I would like to add something. I think we were also involved in this project because I think there was an opportunity for the migrant community. Maybe the syndicates and other questions. I think there are other types of requisites. But I think this was a great opportunity for the community, because we are migrants, to form those businesses and be ahí presentes, ¿no? Aunque seamos una comunidad inmigrante, podemos hacer la diferencia y creo que esa fue la oportunidad y creo que por otro medio iba a ser un poquito más complicado, iba a haber mucho más requisitos y creo que esa fue la gran oportunidad para nosotras, ser una comunidad inmigrante de, de involucrarnos en una cooperativa. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Irania. Sí, voy a, a, a traducir esto también uh, porque... Uh, sorry. No, I want to translate this. <laughs> It's normal, eh? Ilana, you say it also in Italian English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so, um, Sirenia was actually saying that uh, uh, for them was a, a big opportunity also for uh, uh, them as, a, as migrants, so as a group of women uh, uh, migrants. Um, and so in this way that they could actually uh, move also mm, I mean, strengths uh, on, on this aspect of identity for them, like uh, a community of migrants. And they wouldn't be the same in a trade union where also rules are different, but also uh, they could not actually move forward on what are they, um, well, the, the topics and the agenda important for them as a migrant. I hope that the translation more or less worked. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias, Irania Araceli. Ha sido una sorpresa maravillosa. Gracias. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you also from on behalf of us, on behalf of Eureka for joining us. Um, there is another question here in the chat from Jonathan um, asking about um, the replication or small scale expansion and, and what role governments and public institutions can play. Um, you know, what, what can they do to support existing cooperatives, new cooperatives. Um, so I'll turn this over perhaps first to Ricardo, maybe also Mark. Thank you. And then I think also on the scaling, <clears throat> I'll let Julia re reply because she actually has done some really interesting work on the scaling models mm -hmm. of cooperatives and social enterprises. Um, just on the previous question really quickly, uh, it's very interesting uh, talking about unions and worker cooperatives because 
there are clearly two diff two models that are designed to give more powers to the workers. And uh, in that sense, there's some strong similarities. I think the one key difference, of course, is that in the union, you don't have the ownership component. And uh, you're, you're given more power, but also always negotiating with somebody else who actually owns and runs the business. The cooperative, you run your own business. And also, <clears throat> another interesting thing is there's historically been some real kind of skepticism on the part of unions towards worker cooperatives. Uh, sometimes they're seen as a kind of a workaround, you know, to, to keep exploiting workers, making them think they're owners. And of course, we, we have cases of uh, kind of spurious uh, worker cooperatives where that happens, but when, when the worker cooperative model really works and is genuine, like in the case we've seen today, that certainly is not, a, not an issue. On the, on the role of government, uh, before letting Julia reply on the scaling, uh, specifically more broadly, um, there's really a, a wide range of, uh, of actions that can be taken. Um, I think the first one is not just uh, for government, but the, there's one element that's really just a cultural element that needs to be there. Uh, understanding that cooperatives are a business model that is viable and has the same dignity as, uh, as other types of business models. And it's not just kind of there, you know, in the niche for niche issues or to remedy some, some problems, but confined to that. No, it can actually be applied across the board and it can work across the board. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done there in like education and, and culture. Uh, and then as Jonathan was saying, legal frameworks uh, are hugely important because it's important for uh, there to be a level playing field uh, among different types of enterprises. And so cooperatives should be allowed to operate in every sector where they can operate um, should be given more flexibility, should be recognized by law. And that's not the case in, uh, in many countries. Where, where they are, uh, they actually uh, can be very successful. So um, hugely important, the, the role of, of legal frameworks. And uh, so as long as that's okay with you, I was gonna pull in Julia on the scaling aspect, if that's okay. Very, very briefly, because I'm not really an expert in this, but I think there are, I would see three different uh, scaling strategy. The first one, which is the mainstream strategy, is scaling wide, which means uh, uh, the attempt, which implies the attempt of, uh, of increasing the number of recipients uh, and providing the same service to more people. The second strategy is uh, a scaling deep, which implies conversely, um, they endeavor to address uh, new needs uh, uh, in the frame of the same community. So to, uh, to, to, to try to, to tackle uh, new challenges once one particular service, for instance, has been uh, designed and provided and ensured to a certain number of recipients that are in need in that particular community. There is then a third strategy which implies the replication of the same model, but which also, which is the one that was followed, for instance, by social cooperatives in Italy when they, when they emerged back in the 90s uh, that I mentioned before, which also implies networking, a strong networking among the, the, the joining uh, social cooperatives in the case of Italy, but it could work in any other in any other in any other context, and it is the case, for instance, of of the cheese board uh, of the cheese board case. So networking allows then to to uh, size the, uh, the co some economies of scale, which may result from the fact of uh, getting together while uh, remaining small. And um, yeah, so there, there is another, I think, interesting networking strategy that is being in the process of being developed by many cooperatives in Italy. And Eurizia is actually carrying out a study on this on net on network on contractual um, contratti di rete, contract, contractual networks, which also I think has great potentials that can harness the capacity of uh, different organizations to get together to share the same resources, objectives, and also workforce, for instance. So to allow for more um, work integration and work inclusion projects to be finalized. Thank you, Julia. 
We're um, just about out of time here, um, but thank you to everyone for these, these questions and, and for the, the rich debate. Um, if there's any of our panelists who want to make some um, concluding remarks, um, I see in particular uh, Mark, who I was going to allow to jump in earlier and then <laughs> we kind of cut him off. But if anyone wants to say um, anything else, um, now's the time and we'll just take another couple minutes and, um, and then we'll close this first session. But I will remind you that uh, we'll be here again on November 18th uh, with some different uh, around the world video screenings and um, some other researchers from Yurikse um, talking about empowering communities. So um, if anyone wants to, to say anything further, you can open your mic. If I, <clears throat> if I may just add um, to Jonathan, I just posted uh, you and, and for everybody, but I just posted you a link actually on uh, research that we are conducting, uh, which is actually based on a tool that we also developed with uh, Erikse, um, where you can find actually a world map. Um, and uh, on this world map, if you click on different countries, you can find their country reports, which will give you insights uh, on the legal frameworks um, uh, that is actually uh, applicable in that country on the cooperative legal framework. So also what has just been said now, the, um, the legal framework indeed is, is, is very important for the enabling environment of co-ops. Um, it's it's uh, national reports that you can find there from the different countries for the moment, they're around 60, 70 already um, uploaded. Um, they are actually written for, um, let's say for, for uh, people who don't have to be lawyers to understand them. And they have also an interesting component, which is um, discussions and interactions with the cooperative movement of the country to see actually what are their recommendations to the policymakers, how they could actually improve the legal frameworks uh, of the country. I have to say US and UK are both in the pipeline. In the Americas, the US is the last one to be uploaded. Um, from the other countries, they're all already there, but both are in the pipeline. So Jonathan, also um, a hint to you. Um, in the next weeks, you will be able to find also UK and US uh, on that uh, online map. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to everybody. Um, for those of you who are joining us on Zoom and can read the chat, um, just want to point you to a very nice comment here from uh, Sarah Frank, who brings up um, some other really important aspects of these two videos. Um, you know, one about uh, what what you do um, when people you know, with the people that you have in your organization, instead of getting rid of people with flaws, um, you you work with them and you find solutions. And I, I really want to thank you, Sarah, for, for that point. And again, thank you um, to everyone. Can I build just on this? Uh, yes, so yes. <laughs> go ahead, Sarah. But um, uh, I mean, I, I really find very interesting this uh, last comment from Sarah. And um, um, I would just just to underline that what we tried with this video is also to contribute to, I mean, provide new insights about how important this is to look at cooperatives with different lens, not just, I mean, with a conventional also uh, theoretical approach where we uh, only look at cooperative performance, uh, uh, measuring how income has increased or not, because we are talking about something absolutely different. So how is important to uh, uh, value or take into consideration motivation, what actually uh, move people to stay together and to engage in a different form of business. So uh, I think that uh, with a conversation we just had also with the RSLE and the Sirenia and uh, the video of cheese board that provide uh, strong insights in this sense and also so it's important also that we brainstorm and we continue debating and discussing of what uh, cooperative performance at the end really means uh, that uh, goes absolutely beyond not is in, income is a fundamental but is a part of the story and uh, is we hope that i mean with this contribution also we can uh, uh, put additional insight in this debate and thank you very much everyone for joining today because it's uh, absolutely um, amazing to have this chance to uh, share and uh, develop new ideas all together thank you yeah thank you very much and I, you know i'm even um even happier about this event originally our, our partnership was meant to be an in-person event here in trento and um you know I think we all know what's going on in the world and because of the, the lockdowns and COVID, we weren't able to do this, but 
um, you know, being able to do this event online instead has really enabled us to have a different kind of conversation, bringing in people from all around the world and, um, you know, the, the protagonists of the story as well. And um, so it's, it's really a pleasure to have been able to do this webinar together with um, Around the World and the International Cooperative Alliance and Yurikse. Thank you once again to all of our panelists and all of the participants and um, really hope to see everyone at our uh, second webinar on November 18th. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, bye.